Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. Well, back in the 1950s and 60s in Connecticut, something rather magical happened. Think of it like a bubble forming over a few towns, a baseball bubble, and inside it, Connecticut's own version of a field of dreams. Now, if you've ever seen the movie, you know it's about a magical baseball story, and that's what we have for you today. Just one regional high school in Litchfield County generated a number of professional major league pitchers, four of them in all. And what's more, they all came from the same extended family. Now, all four were incredibly talented. One, though, went on to have a particularly stellar career, and he is our guest today. Steve Blass achieved something that only about a dozen other human beings on this planet have ever done. And that's pitch a complete nine-inning game in the seventh game of World Series. More incredibly, he pitched two such complete games in the same 71 World Series, leading his Pittsburgh Pirates to an unexpected World Championship. He's going to be along in just a moment to share some of those incredible memories with us. This week's trivia question, what Connecticut invention made electric vehicles possible? Now, not in this century, but back in the 1890s. Well, stick around after the main program for the answer, because then you'll know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. Yale New Haven Hospital was the very first hospital in Connecticut. They opened their doors 200 years ago and later introduced the entire country to the use of penicillin and chemotherapy. Today, some of the brightest minds in medicine choose to work there, and it's the primary teaching hospital for the prestigious Yale School of Medicine. For more information, log on to ynhhs.org. That's ynhhs.org. Well, you don't really have to be much of a baseball fan to appreciate today's episode. Just pretend you're sitting down and watching the movie Field of Dreams. This improbable story features four men from the northwestern section of Connecticut, all of whom went on to pitch in the major leagues. Now, all four are related, if you include marriage. All four went to the same high school, Housatonic Valley Regional High, under the legendary baseball coach there, Ed Kirby. And all four wore the Pittsburgh Pirates uniform, at least at some point in their career. Now, it begins with one family, the Lambs, who lived in Sharon. They had three boys, Pete, Art, and John, all three of whom were good enough to be professional pitchers, except that the oldest, Pete, opted to pursue another passion. But Art and John, well, they went on to sign with the Pirates. Their cousin, Tom Parsons, lived in Salisbury, and yes, he too would sign with the Pirates. And oh yes, the Lambs had a daughter, Karen, and she would marry a guy from Falls Village named Steve, And it's Steve Blass who we're going to have on today's program. And yes, he's the fourth one who signed with the Pirates. Now, as you're going to hear, we hearken back to the 1950s in this episode when life was simpler and a day of playing ball outside or riding a bicycle was what, frankly, many a boy did. Steve Blass loved baseball, and he also played varsity basketball and ran cross country. But by all accounts, as good as his fastball and slider were, he had determination, a determination to push himself to see what he could achieve and accomplish. And many an observer say that that's what drove him really to the incredible success he attained. Now, not only was he a professional baseball player for many, many years, he also made the difficult transition to the broadcast booth afterwards. His sense of humor and naturally down-home character came through loud and clear for many years after that. Well, now in full retirement, he's still really active because he's an ambassador for the Pirates. And at age 81, he finds the time to come back to his hometown from time to time to do things like host charity golf events and just be that personable guy next door that he's always been. It was an honor to get the chance to speak with Steve and review both his storied career achievements and wait until you hear those stories as well as his early years growing up here in Connecticut. Steve, I feel in a lot of ways when I talk about your story that it's almost like a field of dreams story to me. You know, I look at this heartwarming, kind of wholesome young kid from the hills of northwest Connecticut who went on to make it big in the majors, and 
Maybe we could start off talking about Sagala Field, where you sort of cut your teeth on playing baseball as a youngster. What was it like? And just kind of describe what Northwest Connecticut was like in those days. Well, first of all, I refer to it as Falls Village and Canaan. It was like a Norman Rockwell setting, and I felt like I was Tom Sawyer and my Uncle Bill was Huckleberry Finn. Playing our, our first field was up by the police barracks on Route 7, about a half a mile from Massachusetts border. Sagala Field was basically a lot, an open field that we played on. When I was eight years old, I was dazzled, but we had two kids in that league. They were the 12 year olds. They were actually shaving. I mean, they, they were that far advanced in front of me in so many ways. And ironically, just last week, I was up at my uh, little league field that had moved down and they created another little league field, which was mo- a, a lot better than the original one back in 1950. This one had a home run fence and dugouts and everything. So this past week I went and kind of sat in the stands and, and, and got a little emotional looking at the field that's named after me in Canaan. And then I remember that at age 12, my last year of little league, I hit two home runs over that fence and that led the league in home runs. <laughs> I had two in one game that led the, the league that, that particular year in 1950. One unique thing about our grammar school, we created a, a new grammar school when I was coming up through first and second and third grade. And we built it on a slope and we built the baseball field there in back of our school. And it was on a slope to the point where if you were batting and you hit the ball, he had to run uphill to first base. So there were very few infield hits. But once you got to first base, stealing second and third was quite comfortable. The problem was getting to first base. I always remember that about our field. It was not level at all. I didn't get to play on a level field after Little League until I got to high school. So that was kind of interesting. But it was a wonderful time right around 1950. There wasn't much negativity going around in our little area. It was quite wonderful. I mean, uh, it was a time, I think, in, in America where uh, you had some breakfast and mom said, be home for dinner. And you, <laughs> if you had a bicycle back then, you felt like you owned your little town of Falls Village or Lakeville or Sharon, the six little towns that, that created one high school, small high school, beautiful building uh, near the Housatonic River. It was a great time to grow up there. It was a great place to grow up. I sold little packets of flower seeds or vegetable seeds so I could get my first BB gun. I worked on a farm and and the school breaks in the summer. I will tell you this, recess of school for the summer, summer break in school, I would wake up in the morning. The first thing I would do is run to the window and see if the weather was going to be good enough to play ball that day. And I always had a ball in my hand. It was just a Norman Rockwell kind of a setting. It was was time, sore time. (laughs) Well, and it's also important that you say a ball because you were a three-letter varsity guy in high school, right? The kind of ball didn't really matter. I did letter through the four years. I had had some varsity letters and I had some junior varsity uh, letters because uh, I had to kind of wait my turn before I became a varsity baseball player because we had so much talent in front of me. You mentioned that a lot of us signed pro contracts to play pro baseball, and I kind of had to wait my turn which was all right. We had a fabulous program under Ed Kirby, my baseball coach, who kind of sent us all to pro baseball. There were other coaches, too, uh, along the way. It was a a great time, great place. Well, it was kind of a family affair, too, for you, I mean. (laughs) Yeah. So let's talk about that side of it. I married a girl, Karen Lamb, from Sharon, Connecticut. She had three pitchers in her family. The oldest one, Pete, could have signed a contract, but decided to go to UConn instead. And then Art was next in line, who had the best stuff of all of us, I think. And he signed a pro contract with the Pirates uh, the year before I did and blew his arm out. And that was it. And then I signed. And then Karen's brother. So her cousin, Tom Parsons, made the big leagues, briefly with the Pirates and briefly with the Mets. And then... uh, her husband signed, and then her other brother signed. So, yeah, it was a kind of a family affair. John Lamb, when he signed after I did it, John actually saved a game for me at Three River Stadium. He would have had a longer career, but a freak accident. John Lamb was with us in 70 and a little bit in 71, and then in spring training the next year was pitching batting practice. The screen didn't protect him, and a line drive got past that screen and uh, gave him a major head injury. 
Now, everybody growing up, and I played ball just like everybody growing up, knows there's a point in time where you're you're watching the other kids throw the ball and you say, wow, this guy's got some stuff. Yeah. And you could see the look on their on that person's face that they realized it too. When did that moment happen for Steve Blass? When did you realize that, wow, maybe I actually could do this? Little League, I started pitching a little bit and it was okay. We also had a Babe Ruth League that you could play in after you uh, did Little League. But in our little grammar school, I remember being in eighth grade and uh, we would play against the other little towns around Lakefield, Canaan and Sharon and Cornwall. I actually got to have a little bit of a name because I had such a strong arm and I could throw so hard. I wasn't accomplished as a pitcher by any means. In terms of development, I started to throw it hard and Babe Ruth. But again, so now I go from that, getting a little bit of a reputation, going to the high school where the, I had no reputation at all. And that's when all those guys were in front of me. Tom Parsons was a senior when I was a freshman. And my boy, Karen's brother, Art, was a sophomore just ahead of me. So I had to wait my turn. And then I did get my turn in my junior year. I threw three no-hitters. And my senior year, I threw two no-hitters. So I was starting to get individual attention. What helped me get attention also was those guys ahead of me who got signed. So the scouts were aware of our high school and this rich stream of pitching that was coming up through. So Tom Parsons signed when I was a freshman. Karen's brother Art signed when I was a, a junior. So the scouts were aware of our little high school. So let's talk about the difference between throwing hard and pitching. <laughs> How much time do you have, Mike? It's huge. So that's the point is, who taught you how to pitch? Well, Ed Kirby gave me the opportunity to pitch. And a lot of this was observation. And there's so many different steps uh, on the way to being a good pitcher, not just a good thrower. You know, I, I learned bits and pieces along the way by watching those guys. But Ed Kirby was such a great mentor for pitchers. He had a, a book of fundamentals, which was about two inches thick. And you were required to read that and know it before you were going to play varsity baseball at Houston Tonic. Watching those guys and, and then realizing that as I went up further and further high school and then absolutely got the idea when I signed to be a pro that it wasn't enough to try to throw the ball by people. And every pitcher uh, that eventually reaches the major leagues gets that point, even if you're throwing you know, what they're doing now. I mean, everybody seems to be throwing between 95 and 100. I was not in that class you are forced to learn how to make pitches and what to throw, where to throw it, when to throw it. And to me, it became a gut feel. Okay, I got this guy. He was just a little slow on that fastball. He was behind. So I'm going to throw another fastball and see if this is a guy that can't catch up with fastballs at all. Say if I throw a fastball and he pulls the ball, I said, he is on my fastball. So I got to throw him something that is slower. So if he hits the ball harder, it's going to be even further foul. So that gut feel, I maintained that all through my pitching career. I don't know if I could have existed in the current climate of pitching with all the analytics, all the stats, all the information. My approach was to have as little clutter as possible. Pitchers in the majors now have little transmitters in their ear where they can hear things that are said to him. That would have driven me crazy. I would have needed a microphone in there too because I was bought up when somebody said to me, you should respond uh, with respect. So I would have been a mess. Now, what I didn't tell you before we started this was when I grew up playing baseball, I was a catcher. So I know the importance of the relationship between the catcher and the pitcher. Absolutely. And I heard a great story about you and Manny Sanguian Apparently, his communication skills, because of his, I guess, broken English, were not always so easy for you and he to have a conversation at the mound. Is that true? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we came to communicate m much better. But early on, I think Manny Sanguin spoke better English when he came to the big leagues in 1968 than he does now. And he's a good enough a friend that I can say that. We became really, really close and connected to the point where I could almost start winding up when he put his fingers down to tell me what pitch to throw because I knew what he was going to call. In fact, one of the early games that he caught, 
I had a situation with Ernie Banks, uh, Hall of Famer, 500 career home runs. When the bases were loaded, nobody out. He came out to the mound, lifted up his mask and said simply, oh, you know, and then went back. That was the conference. <laughs> that was the absolute conference. And Ernie hit the next ball into uh, Lake Michigan. So I guess I didn't know. But, uh, yeah, we, we had those times. But there was also a, a great moment in the seventh game of the World Series where Davey Johnson, very good major league second baseman for the Orioles and later on great manager, was up in a tough situation. And we wanted to get him to a point where I could throw a high inside fastball because I thought that he would chase that out of the strike zone. and We could strike him out. And we got to that point a couple of sliders away. And so we had him set up thinking away so we could come up and go with our plan of trying to get him to chase and, and swing and miss at a high inside fastball. He called for it. I threw it the perfect place. He didn't swing at it. And you can see in the World Series tape where Sangi shows his frustration, clenches his fist because he knew, I knew also that we had him right where we wanted to. And he was a good enough hitter where he didn't chase, but our plan was good. He was just a little bit better by taking that ball. And we did get him out, but there was kind of a nice little subtle thing in the World Series where it showed how connected we were, pitcher and catcher. And some obviously, as a catcher, you could appreciate that story. Absolutely. I, let's stick with the 71 World Series. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's one of your favorite topics. You know, when you talk about Field of Dream stories and fairy tale like major league careers, this 1971 World Series was just the cream of the crop. You, and I'm just going to, spoiler alert, tell everybody, you pitched two complete games in that series, the third and the seventh. The Orioles were completely favored to beat the Pirates. They had won all sorts of games coming into the series. They had four pitchers on their staff that were 20-game winners. They won the first two games, and they hand the ball to Steve Blass in the third game of the series, and you go on to pitch. I think in that game it was the three-hitter and then later a four-hitter, but tell us, I mean, you must have been nervous coming into that third game. I mean, all the pressure's on you to try and stem the bleeding. That was a great team. That's one of the great teams, I believe, in the last 100 years of Major League Baseball. The 71 Orioles, Hall of Famers, 420 game winners, guys like Frank Robinson, Brooks Robinson, Boog Powell. I mean, even the managers in the Hall of Fame, Earl Weaver. Yeah, they had won their last 13 regular season games. They swept the playoffs, and then they beat us in the first two games. If you lose that third game to that team, you're cake. And uh, I got into this bubble. They talk about the bubble. I was three pitches ahead of myself. I'm going to do this to Boog Powell. I'm going to show him a fastball because he's a fastball hitter, but it's not going to be in the strike zone. I'm going to get him to where I can throw a big slop curve. So I got into that bubble like in the second inning of the seventh game. I was just rolling along. I mean, uh, I think the third game took two hours and 17 minutes. Game seven was 2.06. Mike Quayer was pitching good. I was pitching good. So we were both on a roll. I was going out there and, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this and do that, and I could do it. Uh, just a little bit of a backstory in that I didn't pitch until the third game because I got my face ripped off in the playoffs against the Giants. And that was because I had never pitched in postseason atmospheres before. So in 71, when I got to pitch against the Giants in the playoffs, I fell into the trap of thinking that, okay, this is not the regular season anymore. I've got to be better. I've got to be faster. I've got to strike people out. This is an elevated arena. And I tried to strike everybody out, and it didn't work. It did for first four innings of the first game. Got a lot of strikeouts. But then they caught up to me because I thought I had to throw hard and strike people out. So I get past that, and I said, if I get a chance to pitch in the series, I've got to go back to what got me here. I was averaging 15 wins a year. I was at the top of my game until I fell into that trap about postseason play. You know, when I look back at the overview of the whole series, Mike, I didn't think about it then because you're developed and taught to shut all the emotions and awareness of the enormity of the situation. You've got to block that out or you can't perform at that level in that kind of a situation, World Series atmosphere. But as I look back, I said, my God, I grew up in Fallsville, it's Connecticut, around population around 1,100, and I'm going to pitch in the World Series. There's going to be 50,000 people. 
watching everything I do. There's going to be millions watching on TV. Every once in a while, I'll sit up late at night with a glass of wine in my hand and say, how about that? The kid from Fallsville was performing like that. Not only getting the opportunity, but performing like that. Even when I was interviewed by Joe Graggio after the sixth game, knowing I was going to pitch the seventh, he said, are you ready for this? And I said, yeah, I'm ready for this. How fortunate I am to get the opportunity to find out if I'm good enough to handle this. I think I can, but I don't know until I do it. And I want that. I'm obsessed with finding out. And that's kind of what drove me all the way up through the minor leagues. I was nervous, sure. I, I didn't sleep much before the seventh game. But uh, when I look back, that's the storybook part of it. That seventh game, nobody in the National League has done that since. One of the great things that happened in the seventh inning, we're ahead one to nothing. And I go out to pitch the seventh inning. I just picked up the ball. I just walked around the mound for a minute before I started warming up. I said to myself, I'm so glad I had the presence to do this. I want to just take it all in. So I just took a visual walk around the mound, looking up into the stands, all the people. You know, I got out of that bubble for a moment, but I was able to get back in. But I wanted to take it all, all in because I said, I may never have the opportunity to be in this situation again the rest of my life. And I was right. So I had that. I, I'm not a computer guy, but I had that hard drive. I remember taking it all in and then going back to work. The top of the ninth wound up being the final two to one. I couldn't wait. I didn't want to get any runs. I wanted us to get retired one, two, three, so I could get out there and find out if I was good enough to do it. So I was pacing. It took forever. And I went down into our clubhouse, which is kind of attached to the back of the dugout. I was pacing, and Bob Prince, our play-by-play guy from Pittsburgh, was down there. And I said, Bob, what the hell are you doing in here? He said, me, what the hell are you doing out there? Go get me three hours so I can do some interviews. (laughs) So I went out, and I got him out one, two, three, and nine pitches. But there was a process in that. Boog Powell let off as a three, four, and five hitter. And he could tie it up with one swing of the bat. Monster, monster strength he had. But I'd gotten him out all seven times I'd faced him before. And I got, got him out again, showed him some fastballs. Finally threw him the slow curve. I know I could get him with, and he bounced out the second for the first out. And now I got Frank Robinson, Hall of Famer, 500 home runs. And when I'd won game three, I'd won it five to one. He hit a home run for their only run, hanging slider. Here's another guy that can tie it up with one swing of the bat. I threw him the first pitch, and I let go of the ball, and I realized that it was going to hang. And I said to myself, this is the same slider that he hit out of ballpark in game three. And as a slider got to him, I looked up to the heavens. I said, Lord, if you can get me out of this mess, I'll be a good Catholic boy for the rest of my life. And he popped the ball straight up in the air as it's coming down. I kind of said, well, I don't know about the guarantee there. <laughs> But uh, he popped it straight up in the air, and uh, that was the second out. And, of course, the third out was a ground ball that hit off the side of the mound. And I thought as it went by me, that's an obvious base hit, ground ball at the middle for a base hit. But I was so locked in, I hadn't realized that Jackie Hernandez, our shortstop, had been shading up almost in back of second base. And he got the bouncer chest high. And I turned around, I said, catch it. And he caught it. And then I said, throw it. And he threw it. And looked around at Roberts in the first base. I said, now you catch it. And he did. And it all breaks loose. The release is incredible. Because the out is recorded at first base. And now the championship is etched there forever. We are World Series winners that will never change. And that's all I could think of instantly. And all I could do is run over and jump on Bob Robertson. And, you know, as a kid, you maybe pretend sometimes, what would I do if I got the last out of the World Series? And we all play with that. Heck, I did that a thousand times when I was throwing a ball against the barn when I was 10 years old in Falls Village. But you don't know what you're going to. I just ran over to where that last out was recorded because that was what made it final and official. And I jumped on Bob Robertson. And uh, But the release is unbelievable because you're in that bubble. You're locked in. Got him out one, two, three on nine pitches. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. And it's, it's never going to change. <laughs> Wow, Steve. Wow. I, I, <laughs> I can't even tell you. I have chills going up my spine having listened to that. That's just tough to top. I do, though, want to have you tell the story 
of what happened at the end of the third game. You had a surprise visitor meet you on the field. And I think maybe that's kind of the best way to wrap this whole thing up. I pitched that masterpiece of my life in the third game. I'm on the field getting interviewed by Tony Kubek. And I'm looking at this guy struggling to get through security on the top of our dugout at Three River Stadium. And as I look back, you know, I'm distracted by him. And I can't, I didn't have any glasses on or anything. He's far away. But all of a sudden, I see he jumps off the top of the roof of the dugout. And when he hits the ground, of course, I see it's my dad. This plumber from Falls Village, Connecticut, was not going to be denied getting down on that field with his son. And we all have dads or have had dads. And we have these singular moments. I will never forget that the rest of my life. There's a picture of me giving him a hug with my arm around him. He's kind of got his, his head and face kind of nestled in my neck. And that's an image that I will take to my grave. It's one of the great moments in my life. It just doesn't get much better than that. So when, when we talk about, you know, Tom Sawyer existence or growing up in a small town, I've been fortunate enough to live a charmed life. Every dream that I've had in so many areas has come to pass. Even going back to being at age 18 when the Pirates gave me a chance to live my dream, I will never quit on them. Yeah, they struggle. But hey, it wasn't the Mets, it wasn't the, wasn't the Yankees, it wasn't the Red Sox, it wasn't, it wasn't anybody else. It was the Pittsburgh Pirates. They will have my loyalty, which happens to be a huge word for me. They will have my loyalty for the rest of my life. And, uh, and it goes along with that kind of stuff. And my dad coming out on the field after I won a World Series game, we actually snuck him into the locker room. You can't even think about that now. And there's a great picture of me and Nellie Bryles and Dave Justy and my dad pouring beer on each other in the clubhouse after that third game. I mean, that's storybook stuff. You can't script that. It's stuff that just has happened to me along the way in this baseball journey and this wonderful journey of being married to Karen for 60 years and my 64th year right now uh, being uh, involved with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Kind of rare stuff, rare air, and I don't take it lightly. Well, that wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. Well, I don't know about you, but that story about Steve Blass's father making his way onto the field to congratulate his son after Game 3, well, warmed my heart to hear the story, and it certainly harkens back to a day when life seemed to have many more of those types of moments. I very much want to thank our special guest for today's program, former Pittsburgh Pirates pitcher and broadcast announcer Steve Blass, a native of Falls Village, Connecticut, and an ambassador not just for baseball, but for the entire state of Connecticut. The answer to this week's trivia question, the question was, what Connecticut invention made electric vehicles possible? But not in this century, back in the 1890s. Well, the answer is copper wire insulated in rubber. It made the ability to charge electric vehicles and pass the electricity through the car without shocking the passengers inside possible. And that rubber insulation was invented right here in Connecticut. Next week, we'll have the incredible story behind how Connecticut led the way in manufacturing electric vehicles in the 1890s when 50% of the cars on the road ran on electricity. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy. Stay healthy.